All right, good morning. We're going to talk about the Russian Revolution today. All right, when we talk about the Russian Revolution, it's actually two different revolutions in one. Uh, you've got a revolution that happens in March, and then you've got a revolution that happens also in November. Now, uh, March Revolution, underlying causes. Uh, first of all, Russia hasn't changed a lot in about 50 to 80 years. Uh, the Russia we're talking about here is almost the same as the Russia of Catherine the Great. The biggest difference is in the late 1800s, I think it was the 1880s, uh, the serfs are freed. Other than that, nothing really changes. And almost as soon as the serfs are freed, the government cracks down and becomes super conservative again. So there's this real lack of reforms and lack of change where the rest of Europe has been changing all through the 1800s. You have absolute monarchy. Uh, Tsar Nicholas II and even his dad all believed in absolute monarchy. Absolute monarchy, as we've learned, failed in the rest of Europe, but Nicholas continued to think that the monarchy should be strong, it should only answer to a few people. We also have immediate causes. The most obvious immediate cause is World War I. World War I is brutal on Russia. Russia loses over 10% of its population. It loses over 2 million people in 2016, over 2 million people in 2015. It loses almost 2 million people in 2017. And uh, you see they're poorly equipped soldiers. When I mean poorly equipped, you have soldiers going to the battlefield without weapons, without guns, without uniforms, and they're actually told to take it off the dead soldiers next to them. And then we have bad leadership. There were incompetent Generals, Nicholas II is actually trying to lead the war from the battlefield. And just really bad leadership. There's also the problem of transportation. I didn't put it on here, but tr the transportation system in Russia completely breaks down. By the time we get to 1917, neither the soldiers nor the people at home are being fed because there's no food left and what food is available cannot get to the battlefields. Now, family issues. The family issues in Russia were really, really interesting. I really recommend that you do some research on this. There's some Netflix shows, there's some books out there, some really easy stuff to read about Nicholas and Alexandra. Problem number one, Nicholas is away at war. Nicholas is trying to lead from the battlefield. Uh, he's trying to lead the war, he's trying to lead the country, and he fails at doing both. Uh, Tsarina Alexander is going crazy. Uh, she is stuck at home. She's losing her mind. She's got a sick child named Alexia. Alexia's got hemophilia. So any little bump, bruise, scratch, nosebleed could kill the prince. And out of nowhere, there's this self-proclaimed holy man, this mad monk named Gregory Rasputin. Nobody knows anything about him. He almost like comes out of thin air. He claims he can cure the prince of his hemophilia. Nicholas and Alexandra let him into the palace, make him their most trusted and important advisor. Nicholas and Alexandra start listening only to Rasputin. Uh, and the, but Rasputin really is a drunk. He's a womanizer. He is a liar. He's not who he says he is. Uh, the story of Rasputin gets even more interesting. He is eventually murdered in 1916. And stories go that he is poisoned, he's shot, and when they rip out his heart, his heart is still beating. All right, on the right-hand side, you'll see two pictures. The top right is Tsar Nicholas II. And the bottom right is this guy named Prince Lvov. Um, on March 12, 1917, Tsar Nicholas II is going to start making arrangements to step down and a provisional government is proclaimed. And then the Tsar makes good on his promise. On March 15th, he retires. He abdicates his throne. And Prince Lvov is going to become the leader of this new government. Uh, he was Nicholas's prime minister. He's the one who Nicholas handpicks to lead this new government because in reality, 
uh, Nicholas has hopes that he will be able to come back after the war is over. Now, this provisional government, it wanted to keep fighting in World War I. It did not think it should stop fighting, even though so many people were dying and the war wasn't going so well for Russia. Uh, they said that Russia needed to keep fighting for honor and Russia needed to keep fighting because if the Allies won, Russia needed to be able to get some of the victory spoils. Now, this March Revolution is fairly moderate. There's not a lot of change. It was mostly an upper class or an elite uh, revolution. People wanted more self-government. They wanted some equal laws. They wanted universal suffrage, meaning everybody could vote. They wanted rights for women, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, basic things that everywhere else got many, many years ago. Now, this provisional government is going to fail. The man on the right is Alexander Kerensky. Alexander Kerensky is going to become the prime minister in May of 1917. He's going to make a couple of mistakes. Biggest mistake, he keeps fighting. Even though it was clear the people of Russia did not want to fight anymore and Russia was on the verge of not being able to fight anymore, he continued the war because he knew the United States was going to join the fight. And he was right. The United States joins the fight and the United States helps Britain and France win World War I, but Russia is not going to be there at the end. Alexander Kerensky also refuses to confiscate large, escape, large estates and he refuses to give land to peasants, which makes everybody angry. Peasants want land to secure their livelihood, make sure that they have a place to call home. And by not giving land to those peasants, he, the peasants don't really like him. And at the same time, the reason he does not want to take away land from the landholders and give it to the peasants is he's afraid that the people who do have money, the people who own the large estates, they would stop supporting the war if they lost their land. So Alexander Kerensky is really in this catch-22, this he's stuck between a rock and a hard spot. And really Kerensky has no idea how angry the Russian people are. All right, the Bolsheviks. And before I do the Bolsheviks, I want to give you your word of the day. Uh, it's going to be Easter themed because this is Easter week. I think your word of the day will be chocolate. Everybody loves Reese's chocolate Easter eggs. So we'll make the word of the day chocolate. Now onto the Bolsheviks. Uh, you see here, this is a guy named Vladimir Lenin. He's going to become the leader of the Bolshevik party and the communist revolution. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, he's got an interesting story to him. Uh, he became a revolutionary way back in 1887. His brother is murdered by an anarchist. And Lenin is going to become a revolutionary in 1887. He is kicked out of the country. And he goes and lives in places like London for a little bit. And he also lives in Switzerland. While he is in Switzerland, he is going to get exposed to Karl Marx's ideas. He is going to read the Communist Manifesto, just like you guys had to the other day. And he is going to become a Marxist socialist revolutionary. Now, he thinks that the bourgeoisie are so weak during this time period in Russia that the working class can cause a socialist revolution and that the working class can cause a political revolution all at the same time. Basically, he's going to try to do two revolutions at once. Now, the Bolshevik party is going to be in the provisional government, but Lenin himself isn't in Russia. Lenin is still banned from Russia. Uh, he's still in Switzerland during World War I. Now, the story gets even more strange because Germany starts talking to Vladimir Lenin and Lenin says, hey, if you can get me back to Russia, I'll start a revolution. I will pull Russia out of the war and we can be friends. So Germany starts to figure out, well, how do we get Lenin to Russia? 
and they figure out let's board him on a train let's board the train up so nobody sees that he's there let's send the train to russia and then like uh surprise here i am i'm ready to start a revolution so russia does that they put him on a train they send him or germany does that germany puts him on a train sends him to russia and in april he says hi guys i'm here to start a revolution and nobody's ready for it lenin is actually chased out of the country and he has to spend a couple of weeks in neighboring Finland. While he is in Finland, he's openly calling for the abandonment of the provisional government. Uh, Lenin says, down with the provisional government, we don't need it. Well, poor Kerensky, he doesn't have enough people to run the government himself. He has to put together a, a coalition and Kerensky tries to work with the Bolsheviks because he needs them to rule, even though the Bolsheviks are in the process of trying to overthrow him. Kerensky, he just has nowhere to turn. All right, the November Revolution is the big one. On November 4th, 1917, there's huge demonstrations against the provisional government. Uh, these Demonstrations are sponsored by the Bolsheviks. All these workers take to the streets and say, down with the government, down with the government. On November 7th, Lenin is going to order the Bolshevik party to take over the Winter Palace, which was where the government was stationed. All of the government ministers for the provisional government get away. And ironically, they are going to escape in cars provided by the U.S. Embassy. And then on November 9th, the Bolshevik led by Lenin, they're going to overthrow the provisional government. Lenin's going to be proclaimed as the new leader of Russia. And news of this spreads throughout the country and people throughout the country join him. Uh, as soon as the government is taken over, Russia and Germany start working on a treaty. And on March 3rd, 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is signed. The war between Russia and Germany ends, and Germany is given a lot of land. Germany gets almost all of European Russia. Russia loses a third of its people, 80% of its iron, 90% of its coal, and then Germany is going to turn around and try and win the war in France. But as we know, it just does not work. In Russia, there's going to be a civil war. A civil war breaks out between what's known as White Russia and Red Russia. White Russia, those are people who supported the monarchy. They are pro-provisional government. They're anti-communist. They're anti-Lenin. It's this ragtag group of people. The Red Russians are going to be the pro-Bolsheviks, pro-communists, pro-Lenin. They want this thing to happen. And things in Russia get so strange that in the middle of World War I, while fighting is going on against Germany, soldiers from the US, Britain, France, and Japan invade Russia at the same time. Now the goal is to keep Russia fighting World War I, even though Russia is trying to withdraw. And a secondary reason is to try and get the Bolsheviks out and restore the monarchy or at least restore the provisional government. Well, this multinational army, they spend one summer uh, not summer, but one winter in Russia, and they say, you know what, this is really cold. We won't want to be here anymore. And that national army is going to withdraw in 1919. The remaining white Russians are going to be defeated in 1920. And by 1921, there's no question that Lenin has won. And 1921 is really going to be the birth of Russian communism. Uh, Lenin, he's a Marxist. He's trying to follow the blueprint that Marx gave in the Communist Manifesto as close as he can. If you read the Communist Manifesto, you know that Marx doesn't really give an ending. It's a cliffhanger. And Lenin, just like Marx, he doesn't really know what to do next. So once the revolution happened, Lenin's going to kind of guess. Now, even though in the Marxist revolution it says workers of the world unite, Lenin actually didn't like workers. He didn't trust them. And Lenin, he completely rejected this idea of a mass party made up of workers. Lenin thinks that you just need a couple of hardcore communists, and a couple of hardcore communists could run the country. 
Uh, he's very famously says something to the effect of if 200,000 nobles can rule all of Russia, then 200,000 communists can as well. Uh, Lenin also didn't appreciate peasants. He saw peasants as backwards. He saw peasants as weak. And he saw peasants as second-class citizens. So he really only included them in his revolution because he had to. Now, Lenin is going to put the orthodox communist policies in place. Maximum incomes for everybody. He's going to collectivize everything. The government's going to take over as much as they can. No private property. All the stuff that communists are, say they're going to do. Lenin did. But pure communism didn't work and Lenin found that out very quickly. A widespread famine happened because no food was being produced. Uh, industrial production dropped because nothing was being made. And by 1921, Russia's producing a sixth of what it did before the war. So they have to figure out something real quick. And Lenin comes up with this idea called the New Economic Policy, also known as the NEP. When Lenin realizes that pure communism is not working, he introduces parts of capitalism. And that kind of surprises a lot of people because they don't know this. Uh, for example, peasants, they have to make or grow a certain amount of food, but if they grow extra, they can keep that extra. And they can do whatever they want with that extra food. They can sell it. They can store it. They could sell it to a private market. They could sell it to the state. Uh, once the quota is met by the peasants, anything above and beyond that, they can do what they want. Peasants were guaranteed private land ownership, which is something communism says you're not supposed to do, but the NEP gave land to the peasants and it gave land to other people as well. Private, got, private industries are set up, private trade is set up, private businesses are set up, but the government's going to retain control of heavy industry. The government's going to keep control of banking, foreign trade, just about everything else. It is the new economic policy that stabilizes the government. It is the new economic policy that stabilizes the economy. And by 1924, the private businesses account for about 40% of all foreign trade. Now, it's never going to go above 40%, but that shows you that there is capitalism working within this communist system. Now, not everybody is happy about this, though. Uh, some hardline communists and people who did not agree with any parts of capitalism being in it, they started to speak up. Leon Trotsky was the most famous. Uh, Leon Trotsky wanted to eliminate the NEP. He wanted to get rid of all capitalist issues. And he wanted pure socialism, pure communism. And he said, you know, it'll work. You just have to give it time. Trotsky and Lenin are going to have some arguments. Trotsky and a guy named Joseph Stalin are going to have some arguments. And in the end, Leon Trotsky is going to lose his life over this. All right. Now, a couple of other things that you need to know, and this is not related to our class. This is related to uh, summer semester. First thing for summer semester, all classes are going to be online. I found that out this morning. An email is going to be sent out by the school president, Dr. Rule, later this week. But all classes for summer will be online. Also, registration for summer classes will open on Monday. So look for registration on Monday for summer classes. I encourage you to take summer classes. They're all going to be online. You don't have anything else to do right now. You might as well get some of your schoolwork out of the way, graduate a little earlier. For fall, we're not sure when fall classes are going to open up for registration yet. And that's mainly because we're waiting to hear what our fall classes will look like. But for now, Monday, summer classes will start registering. All summer classes will be online. All right, until then, we'll see you on Thursday. Have a good day.